All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Pat Watson, superintendent from Bloomfield Hill Schools. So thank you for coming. I'm Dave Shulkin, uh, Director of Technology Information Services. Um, I'm very lucky. Uh, just I have two children here in the district. They came through this school. They're now big fifth graders. So I have a little bias towards Conan, just to <laughs> get it on the record. So one of the first things we want to talk about is why we need a bond. And there's quite a few different things. One of the main focus points, absolutely. So one of the main focus points is going to be every learner today and tomorrow deserves their absolute best, right? We've all had the chance to go through school. We've all had pros and cons and different experiences, but every learner deserves that. Every learner also deserves a barrier-free environment. The facilities that we have today don't really meet the needs of all the different students that we have. And then opportunities and experiences that ignite passion in a place in which people are able to belong and thrive. I know for me it was really important in middle school, and I grew up in Ann Arbor, being able to have a teacher that was able to use not just the school facility, but the surrounding area as part of the education to really show us what education could look like. So why? And we've been working at this for quite a few years as we've gone along, Brian, Gobi, and I. But every three years, we do a facility and technology assessment. And during all of that work, both from community input, uh, from all of you, of our staff members, and the work we've done, we needed to focus on a few big, big issues or challenges that we've discovered or identified. Safety and security is a big one, right? We talk about this constantly. I'm going to make an assumption here. All of us went to school at a different time when we didn't worry about the things that we're worried about now in schools. Uh, we could just walk right into a building. You were welcomed. It's a different experience now. Um, our aging infrastructure, uh, just as we were trying under these lights, these are a little bit newer, but just being able to display, as you can see here, it's a little more challenging. If you're a little further back, I know Mr. Gobi in the back there, he can probably barely read this, right, Brian? Uh, not enough students in the middle school. So one of the other big challenges we have in the district is we have been in this process of consolidating over the years. And we, in doing so, we've done the right things. We've made the right choices around that. We've come to the end of that consolidation in terms of our, the way our buildings are currently configured. And let me give you an example of this. So right now, if you're at BH Middle School and you have orchestra, for example, you cannot have all of your orchestra students in a same classroom. You have to break it up into different sections. If I'm at West Hills, I don't have that. I have actually not enough students to have a full orchestra. And so what you're seeing here in the district is kind of this, we have a, the population, the way it's kind of uh, worked throughout the entire district is not even or, or equal. And so that's part one of the challenges that we have. As you might all know, if you live in the township, we, the district is in charge of recreation and parks. We don't really have any parks. We don't have in the district. We have some green spaces. You, many of you utilize our facilities. You come out to the baseball or the you know football field. You maybe run the track. So those are kind of part of our excuse me our community and green space. Uh, the other thing too is we talked about this when we passed the bond. The last bond that we passed was for the high school. And when we did that, we talked about we need to look at our K-8 spaces, but we were going to give it some time. We went through about a decade, if many of you remember, to get to the high school and to pass that. And then roughly about four and a half years after, we promised that we would go ahead and engage and do that work on the K-8 spaces, and that's where we're at today. So kind of where have we been as someone that's newer to the school district? I wanted to see the planning process that took place. So it goes all the way back to 2014 with the master of property planning. <clears throat> and that was looking at some of the facilities like Pine Lake and Hickory Grove that were closed and what would become of those properties, to the middle school redesign of 1718, to the facility and technology assessment, to the moonshot thinking, what does the district really need? What would move the district forward to be that 21st century type of education that we're all looking for? To the strategic plan, to the board decision on a brighter future and what would it really take? to scope and design to where we are now with board presentations. So this isn't an all of a sudden decision that was made. This was six years in the making of gathering information, talking to stakeholders, making sure everyone had a voice of what really was going to be the best. So again, I feel comfortable that this has long been vetted out, long explained, long researched, and at some point you need to take action. And really now is the time, ideally it would have been two or three years ago as someone coming in, 
looking at the facilities and then comparing the facilities here to the rest of Oakland County than the rest of the state, we are definitely far behind. And what part of this process is we, as you know, many of you, or there's a few of you faces that were part of the scope and design committee. And part of this work just kind of took off when we did the moonshot group, which included some, you know, community members, some staff members, some, uh, some administrators, et cetera. This group and the amount of work, the many weeks and hours, and all of us that we talked about, all the configurations, all of the challenges that we saw each, each week that we met, we're like, hey, this is the next challenge we've got to try to solve. How could we do this by reconfiguring? What could we do? What, did it, what does it look like? And this is the recommendations that we provided the board from that scope and design. It was the two preschool locations, the four elementary schools, the two middle schools, both north and south, and you'll see in the next slide, Bloomfield Hills, uh, the high school projects, if you don't know this, when we built onto the high school, we did not replace the entire high school with new. But this is Andover, the old Andover site, its eighth renovation as I add on to it. The back, west, we call it the West Wing, is still the 1960s, I believe, and the casework still looks like. So we need to do some additional work with this bond. And then, of course, community projects. <coughs> Yeah, so, that, so I'll, I'll speak up, I apologize. Yeah, so we don't have a voice lift in here. This is actually for the TV, so I apologize. So then, and also with the community. So we have Nature Center, we have the farm. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are leveraging all of those assets to include our community. And this is important for us. Schools, we, we, here, we don't have a downtown here. We don't have those things that would bring us together as a community. And so our schools are, are really our only opportunity. And so we want to make sure we're leveraging all of these spaces so we can welcome all of our community into it, whether it is, again, outside of the Nature Center or at the farm if we're all sledding on a snow day tomorrow and all these kinds of things. So I just want to, that's a very, very important part of what this came out of this scope and design. And so in this particular slide, you can see what we did with the configurations. So the big ones, we have the one high school that you know about. We now are consolidating from three middle schools down to two middle schools. And so this is the north at the old Losser High School uh, sites. We'll expand on there and add academic wings. We're also looking at adding a pool there for a community. This would be a much warmer pool, so it's not a competition type pool that the high school is where it's really cold. If you've ever been in that thing, it is very cold. This one would allow us during the day to have community members come in and use that pool for recreational other uses. Um, our South BHMS would be the South, B or the South uh, Middle School. And this would get some expansions as well. And so each one of these sites will get some additions, expansions, renovations. Lone Pine would move up to the West Hills uh, Middle School. Conant here would get renovations and expansion. Way, renov renovations and expansion. And then Eastover would move into the East Hills Middle School site. Big, I want you, the big things to take away from all of this is that we wanted to make sure that we re-leveled this playing field. We still valued, coming out of the scope and design, valued community, uh, community uh, elementaries. We like that. Our neighborhood elementaries were very, very important. It kept, it kept resonating with me as a community member, but also the scope and design. And then the preschools. So we did some heat map and some other research. We know that the preschools, the Telegraph Corridor and the East Side are two of our big spots that bring. So Conant would keep the uh, Blumen Preschool or the preschools here. And then the Fox Hills Preschool would move in to the old Eastover Elementary site. Okay. And then just looking at enrollment in each buildings, we have buildings that are now getting a little out of the line as far as how many elementary students are in each building and how many middle school students. So whether the bond goes forward and passes or not, we're also convening a committee in fall of 2020 that will study the district attendance boundaries. So that's something that if you're interested in serving on, you can already go on the website, click to sign up. The goal is to move as few students as possible, but to try to balance out how many students are in each building. That allows us to enhance the curriculum, make sure we have proper staffing, again, make sure we're fiscally responsible with the money. Fall of 2021, the committee makes recommendations to the board on minor attendance boundary changes, and this will be implemented in fall of 2023. So that gives plenty of time to vet, see what's going on with enrollment, make sure that everyone's had a voice in what's going to happen, and then roll it out in fall of 2023, which at the same time, if the bond passes, when we will start our new configurations of the two middle schools, 
the K through five buildings, and then the two preschools with a construction timeline ending fall of 2026. So what does this include? That's always asked. So we've been doing this work for a little while. We had the scope and design, we've decided what we thought would look like, and then we came out with some numbers, 200 million. So we want to make sure on the safety side, it's one big important bucket. And this is, we're going to, we want to construct secure entryways. If you've ever been to Lone Pine or even Conant here, it takes you a little bit to get in and then the office doesn't stop you. You can go right into classrooms. And so we're going to reinvent or reconstruct those entryways. It's a little bit more secure. And so you're coming through the office, you're being, you're being welcomed by the office staff and not just an open corridor, for example. We're going to improve traffic patterns. One of the things that think, people think about safety, right? They just think about maybe an intruder or someone who's scary. But safety is also sight lines, both inside the building and outside the building. So the principals, the staff can see out into, their re into the recess areas or how traffic patterns flow into our, uh, our parent loops, our bus loops, how those uh, intermingle are very important and big safety issues as we see, you don't want a bus running over one of our little ones, right? Or the parents, if you've ever had a challenge in some of our parent loops, the challenge of the, getting in and out and then back onto the roadway, that can be very dangerous. And so we want to improve those things for safety. Installing fire sprinkler systems. As these buildings, as they were built in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have to sprinkle them. They were built in blocks and you got boxes and corridors, right? If we sprinkle these, one, it improves the safety in terms of, you know, if a fire does occur, you get a little more time to get out. But more importantly, it also provides us some opportunity to open up some of these spaces. So now you can open up some walls. You can have some different glass or different types of architectural um, flexible uh, options inside a building and not just have square boxes. Uh, well, of course, surveillance, access control, so when people walk in, we'll have a little bit more visitor management systems as they walk into the buildings. And of course, we're gonna work on the district-wide public, act, or public um, announcement system. So for right now, if Pat wanted to send out to the entire district, we have some communication tools, but he also now could maybe pick up a phone and then talk to the entire district or send a message across all of those phones. That we would need to go into a lockdown or we need to be aware of some other issue. We've had a chemical spill on Telegraph, need to make sure people are aware. So those will be some of those improvements around the safety. And just kind of piggybacking on the safety piece, we want to make sure we're looking at best practices. So coming up, we're going to Hillel to see how they've set up their security system. We'll also be visiting Lawrence Tech University. So seeing kind of a different private school and what they're doing, and then a university to make sure that we make the best decisions possible to keep all students safe. As far as the educational piece, right? We're an organization about teaching and learning. That is our number one thing. So the bond helps do a lot of different enhancements. For example, install classroom interactive displays and sound systems. As you can see, the board we're using today was outdated about six years ago. So if you're a young student in the back of the room and you're trying to see what's being taught at the front of the board, it's next to impossible. That's a huge problem. Upgrade technology infrastructure, update architectural components. Again, these buildings were designed for everyone to be in a sled desk or the old type of desk where either you lift it up and you have all your stuff in it or you've got the little cubby and put it in. That was the design because that desk was yours and that desk didn't move. I remember one of my teachers in elementary school in the 70s put tape where all your little, you know, the two front tape pieces, you put your desk there and on the back, it never moves, it's not possible. That's not the way students learn. That's not the way they're learning at the university level, and that's not what jobs look like. If you had a chance to go out and see what it work, looks like in the workplace, it's completely different. Improve lighting and indoor air quality. Create STEM and collaborative work environments, and these would be at three different locations. Um, a building of Franklin Road, and then the two middle schools as well, with something smaller at each elementary school. And upgrade and enhance the media centers. The media centers really think of like a small college student union. They've now, in districts that have remodeled, they've become the hub of the building. It's the gathering place for adults and students to come together, where you can bring your class, or part of your class can come down. It is completely different. Also want to improve ADA accessibility and inclusive playground settings. The idea that every student should be able to have their need met. Right now, because of the data of a lot of these buildings, students who have special needs don't have access to everything they really need to have access to. We would improve special education learning spaces, create sensory rooms and therapy rooms. These weren't things that were thought about 
in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s when the buildings were created. We've done the best we can to manage with what we have, but really, it would bring it up to not just 21st century, but it would really mean that every learner could get what they needed to reach their individual full potential. And then preserve and enhance programming options and opportunities. Middle school is a great example. We love band. My daughter's in band. You've got three different middle schools. If you have eight kids in one middle school, 15 in another, and 12 in another that want to be in band, it's going to be difficult to afford that programming. But now if you're talking about the same numbers over two buildings, it's a lot easier to have those type of extracurriculars or to include your languages because you're looking at the number of students that could actually be involved in it. It's easier to do. So we were talking a little bit about the community. Uh, anybody been to the farm before? Just kind of, right? A wonderful gem. Nature Center, another wonderful gem. If you've gone out there, you've walked on a great Saturday morning, you've seen those things. So those are the strategically we're looking at leveraging those assets. Uh, the, uh, district, we've been talking about uh, career uh, STEM and career readiness. And what does that look like across the district, both at the elementary and the middle school and the high school level? Uh, obviously, we're looking at the farm and nature center expansions, making sure that we can not only sled on the hill, but also bring our learners fr from the community in, whether it is, for example, my students who want to learn about uh, science agriculture, right, agricultural science, and they want to watch their stuff uh, grow. And they're going to visit there, and then they're going to bring that virtually back to the classroom. We're going to see those opportunities grow. We also want to make sure that the Farm and Nature Center and those other places are more accessible. We were, we're looking at some footage today, Pat, where we saw how hard or how challenging it would be, even if you just had a sprained ankle walking at some of the farm and to access some of that. So this bond would solve those challenges that we're seeing. Uh, grass and, and green space. We know like Fox Hills, for example, we're looking to bring that building offline. Well, we, we have some, we want to make sure that we preserve some of that green space that we can. Uh, we have another lone pine coming offline. We want to make sure we're going to look at all those opportunities there and options to see what we would do with green space and preserving that. We also have the Pine Lake property where we have green space and some, uh, we still have uh, playground equipment and, and space to go and, and experience. And I think the, uh, the other big one is we want to make sure, is we talk about like safety, for example, we want to make sure that we're protecting our, our perimeter, so for, for example. We also want to make sure it's welcoming. It's a balance, right? So we can build a fortress, but it's not welcoming. It's not welcoming for the students that are here. And so we want to feel safe when we're in the building. But we also want to make sure it's welcoming. And so it's, it's taking this bond, this money, making these spaces better, more conducive to that, more safe, but also more welcoming. Keep in mind, these are all great things for the community, but they're also great things for students. Take the pool, for example. It's great that during the day, if you're retired or have time, you can come in and be part of a program. Right now, our middle school swim team has to go up to high school when time is available. So if that means it's five to seven one night, six to eight another night, that's when they're going to go. So if you've got your sixth grader having to come home, now go back out, go swim, come back yet again, as opposed to how it is in many districts, middle school swim team will swim right after school. Every day. So you know every day when your child's going to be able to swim. Then when it comes to scheduling swim meets, you know that pool is always available for your middle school swim team and you're able to take care of it. So again, these all benefit not just the community, but students. Uh, stakeholder voice. Um, I'm coming from the tradition that everything should be collaborative, it should be transparent, and you should get as many people in the room as possible so that everyone feels they've been heard. So it was nice to see that over these past six years, whether it was master, uh, master property planning, it was students, staff, community, families, uh, municipality elect officials, field experts, administrators, teachers, IT, physical plant services. So really everyone over the past six years has been able to have a voice and those voices have changed depending on the committee, and then all that was put together to come up with this. Um, as far as the bond, debt, and sinking fund, I found this really interesting. Bloomfield Hills has the lowest bonded debt and sinking fund out of all of Oakland County. So to me, what, what does that really mean? It means the board has been good stewards of the money. It shows fiscal responsibility because it's at the absolute levels. So what happens if the bond passes, right? So if the bond passes, we move up 
to right here, which means what districts still have bonded debt and sinking fund higher than Bloomfield Hills? Birmingham, Royal Oak, Clarenceville, Wall Lake, Troy, Rochester, Berkeley, Waterford, Clarkston, Novi, Madison, West Bloomfield, South Lyon, Huron Valley, Avondale, Ferndale, Holly, Oxford, Oak Park, Clawson, Lake Orion, Brandon, Hazel Park. Keep in mind, two of these other districts below are going for bonds and then would jump back up. So even with passing a $200 million bond, it still shows how low the bond to debt and sinking fund would be because the board has been good stewards and showed fiscal responsibility. That shocked me. I couldn't believe this for a community like Bloomfield Hills. Um, again, growing up in Ann Arbor where there's a $1 billion you know, bond that was just passed and a multi-million dollar sinking fund and they're taking down buildings and building brand new buildings and coming from a district where I worked on a bond where we're building a brand new building and tearing down at least one building to see that this board was committed to what do we have, what can we use, how can we ask for the lowest amount of money possible and still return something great. Where is our return on investment for our community? And to be honest, I think it's really there. So everybody wants to know, if you've been on the website, there's a calculator there. The, we have a one, it's gonna be a 1.85 mils increase. And so this is the taxable value of, of your home. Rule of thumb, roughly about half of what your market value is. Just rule of thumb. So that gives you a sense. So for every 100,000, it's $185 in tax increase. So my house is not, no, and uh, it's way up here. Uh, so that helps you, but go onto, the, go onto the website, you'll go into the calculator, you can put in what your taxable value is, and then you'll be able to see what your tax increase would be. I think it's also important to note that the bond dollars that we're, we're asking for as a district, this is, the, this is an investment in our future. We can't pay bills. This is not operational. We're not, do, we're not taking care of those things. We're actually investing in the future. And this isn't investing in the future for the next two or three years. We're hoping to look for 20, 30, 40 years out. But I think more importantly, we're leveraging what we've got. So we're expanding on what we have. We're not building new. We're not doing something you know, really crazy fancy. We want to leverage the assets we have and do it responsibly as we move forward and looking long term. And so I've heard from some community members who want to know, you know, Pat, that's great. I'm retired. My kids have grown. And, you know, I, I did my time. I paid my dues. What's really in it for me? Keep in mind that the quality of the schools is going to determine your home value. Let me, let me explain that a little bit more. So if you can afford to live in Bloomfield Hills, you can live in Northville. You can live in Novi. You can live in Troy. You can live in Ann Arbor. You can live in Gross Point. And if you take a look, what do those communities have that we don't have here? They have parks and other amenities for green spaces. They also have schools that are highly ranked, just like we do. What else do they have? Buildings that are ready for 21st century learning. They've made that investment. So if I'm a young person coming to buy your home with my three to four children in Bloomfield Hills, why should I come to Bloomfield Hills and not go to Northville or Novi or Troy or Gross Point or Ann Arbor if they've invested in their schools and what they look like for the future. So I would say keep that in mind because that is what people are looking for. So when I interviewed for the position here, I knew the high school. High school's great, it's beautiful. Had a chance to go and visit it. Then I got to go visit all the other buildings. I was shocked that it was similar to my experience in the 1970s going to elementary school, walking in Lone Pine and all the open classrooms and seeing the doors at Fox Hills and be a great setting for a movie. And, uh, you know, some of you know, I started to know me, when you know better, you should do better. And we really know better. And now it's a great opportunity to do better and at a cost that will still keep it low. So if your home value is a million dollars, right, it's the value of your home you're looking at $925 a year that you would pay. Questions? Yes. I just wanted to add just on the home value because I recently did have a question and we have a lot of homeowners that have been in their home for many, many years. 
and to, to the extent that you've been in your home for a very long time, chances are with the rebound in value, the value has gone up, but the taxable value, which is what the tax is based on, is capped and doesn't grow as quickly. So it's just something I'm pointing out because I spoke with someone that has quite a da drastic difference as they just received their assessment between the taxable value and their actual market value. Questions? Okay. Yes. How long is the mail How long is that? How many years is it, Tina? Um, about 30, like 29 point something. 30. Do you have a plan B? Uh, this doesn't pass. The plan, plan B. So it's going to be roughly about $8 million a year, the things that need to be done. So when the boiler goes, when the sidewalk goes, when the roof goes, it has to be repaired. Its infrastructure has to be done. So plan B is going to be that has to then come from a general fund that's about $92 million that supports $92 million worth of needs. Then you start looking at do we have to make program decisions. One of the great things that I've loved since I've been here is looking at how small the class sizes are. Do we have to maybe have three more kids per class to afford it? I mean, these are things that are going to have to be done, unfortunately. Um, the can's been kicked down the road long enough. Um, so that, that, to be honest, that would be plan B. We'd have to take it out of the general operating cost, which goes to programs. There's no other way around it. It has to be done. You know, you're looking at, as one person told me, you know, it's a 1950 Buick, right? You, you can't continue to maintain it. You need to eventually get a new car or update it completely and keep the shell and do something. And we're kind of at that point. Um, if you'd like to talk after about some buildings I've seen in Oakland County, what they look like. I was at Troy School District today at the preschool center. Amazing. The flexible spaces for students, the open concept, and the things that they were able to do for students that only enhances the learning was second to none. I couldn't believe it. And I was there with uh, Todd Bidlack, who was with Learning Services team. But good question. Other questions? Yes. One of the things that I think that I've heard a lot of feedback from parents is those of us who have children who are kind of in this mid-age right now, you know, like I have a second grader who goes to school here, mm -hmm. there hasn't been a lot of information about the transition plan itself in terms of where they're going to be and which group of kids they're going to be with because the Conant and Way families specifically are going to be split apart. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Is the t are you going to be coming out with some information that specifically talks about so that would be part of this, kids going to be? Yes, yeah, so that would be part of the, first of all, fall of 2023, your kids are going to be where they're going to be. There's no movement until then. So fall of 2023, if you're a K through five kid, you're in the building. If you're a six through eight kid, you're one of the two middle schools. If you're nine through 12, you're at the high school. As far as what street do you move? How many kids from one street? Is it one block that goes to one elementary and the next block? That would all be part of this committee. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure it's done equitable and to move as few families as possible. That's why you talk about it gets together in fall of 2020. It's a full year process. And then you're still waiting until 2023 to move. So wherever, whatever age your children are or your child is right now, in fall of 2023, they're in a K through five, they're in a six through eight, and they're in a nine through 12 building. That's already a done deal going to happen regardless of what happens with the bond. Again, by taking some of these other buildings offline, now you're saving heating, cooling, and all those other things that go along with running a building. So that's another part of being fiscal, you know, fiscal responsibility. The buildings can't continue to run. We don't need three middle schools. We don't. There's just not the students. Yes? To kind of piggyback off the question, for those of us with younger children that are starting kindergarten, starting first grade, that may start in Clonet, for example, but we are in a neighborhood whose boundaries now would be at the new West Hills, the new Lone Pine, so to speak. Would our children be grandfathered in to be able to stay at Conant beginning in 2023? Or would they be removed in second or third grade to attend a new elementary school? It's going to be the same answer. That's all part of that committee work. And are we going to have waivers? What if I should go to Way, but I'd rather go to Eastover? which will be at East Hills. Can I have a waiver for that? 
How many kids are we looking at total? What are the, you know, looking at the SEMCOG data? What's the birth rate this year and the next two years moving forward? What are the projections? What are we seeing? Are people really turning over their homes in Bloomfield Hills? The more families are coming in. That's why it needs to be a full year and there needs to be a lot of conversation that takes place. And then that question is going to be answered. I can't sit here and say, yeah, everyone can be grandfathered in. Then come to find out when we do the work that, wow, that's great. But now at Conant, we're going to have 120 more kids than any other building. You're bursting at the seams and we only have X amount of classrooms, which means every other building gets 17 kids in kindergarten. You're going to have 27. Well, I don't want that. Well, why wasn't this thought about? Why did you say we could, right? So it has to be done. There has to be a process that makes sense and we need to spend the time. It can't be rushed because we need to get it right because you only get one chance. And we're not talking about moving furniture. We're talking about moving children. People, and I've got three children myself, you know, two in college and one in high school. I am the most overprotective parent you'll ever meet. If we have a snow day tomorrow, but my daughter doesn't, she's not driving to school. I will drive her to school. She can't drive, right? So I get it. But you haven't had a chance to have a voice. And if you have younger children, you haven't had a chance to have a voice. So my best guess is it's going to be a large committee and we need to go block by block by block, see how many students are there, what grades are they in now, how many houses have been sold in the past one, three, and five years, um, how, many been, how many people can get the data have been in their house 30 years or longer, which means they're going to sell sooner rather than later, and really put it together. It's going to be a time consuming effort. Then at the end, everyone's had a voice. The decision's been made. There will be people who don't like the decision, which is with everything that's ever done. But I don't want someone to say, I didn't get a chance to have a voice. I didn't know this was going on. Why were you making this in seclusion without including, you know, your community? Why wasn't it transparent? These are all things after each meeting, Everything needs to be emailed out and go on the website so everyone can see, okay, I'm not going, I don't want to be on your committee, but I want to know, right? That's why it's a year process, and then we can answer that. Make sure you sign up for that mm -hmm. to be on that committee because it really does make sense. Yes, oh, yes. Uh, what about people who uh, their top priority is making sure their child doesn't move, so in, they don't really care what the facilities look like, and they're going to vote no so their kids can where they are. Would that happen if the bond doesn't pass? So this is going to happen regardless of the bond. So forget there's even a bond. The presentation tonight now is just fall 2020, there's a committee to look at attendance boundaries. Again, you can't continue to have an imbalance, right? Fall 2021, committee makes recommendation to the board on minor attendance boundaries. The goal is to move as few students as possible. I live in a different school district than Bloomfield Hills. My son, who's now 23, I fought and petitioned to get him out of the kindergarten where he should have gone to a different building in the school district, and there's 19 elementaries in the school district that I live in, and fought to get him there. And then I transitioned him to another building because we moved to where we needed to be the year after that. So again, I get how important it's going to be. And when you move, a lot of times you move for this school, in this area, and that's what you want. We're not trying to just strip that away from everyone. That's why it needs to be that methodical process with as few students moving as possible. In fall of 2023, bond or not, we'll have the new assignments for students. Again, we have 5,500 students. We're not talking about moving 1,500 of those 5,500 to, or 1,500 to a different building. That is not the goal. And everyone will have a voice. Already people are signing up online left and right, if not to have a voice, to at least sit in and know what's going on and be in the know. And it's scary, right? All these things are scary with your children, regardless of how many you have. I'm just as nervous to some things with my 23-year-old as I am with my 17-year-old. And my 21-year-old is two states away in college, and I text her and call her every day, and I make sure she has a safe walk if she's walking at night, and she texts me before she leaves the library. Which, so I get that. These are very important decisions, and we're taking them seriously, and that's why this process has been put in place. Yes. 
I'm curious, so I'm newer in the district. Welcome, you too. Yeah. <laughs> and um, obviously, yes, one of the reasons we came to this district when we moved cross country. Where'd you move from? California. Wow. Yes. So we did a lot of homework. Okay. So yes, the news of changing everything of what we did our research on, I'm very skeptical and I will ask very hard questions. You should. It's your kids. We all know. Um, that's also what I do in my life. What so, do you do? Sales. Business development strategy. We should be friends, but that's a different time <laughs> a little bit later. But go yeah. ahead. So um, I had heard that the reason Loster High School was not the point to build upon was because it was actually sinking due to the wetland nearby. So what has changed that now we're using that site for a middle school versus saying, no, that we have to shut this site down? Yeah, I've heard two rumors about Wasser. I'll let Mr. Gobi address the first one, then I'll address the second rumor. I don't know if you're going to bring it up or not, but it, had, it was driving me crazy when I first got here, so I'll share it with you anyhow. All right. Okay, so it's not true that Lasser was sinking. Um, there was some movement on one foundation, um, but by no means was it sinking, and that truly is just a rumor. Um, and there are other strategies we can do in construction today. The new, the new portion of the high school is... Um, there was some poor soil conditions there too, and we installed geo piers. So the building sits up on these, they're like stone columns that are driven into the ground. So pilings or geo piers um, could be used if the soil conditions are bad enough that it requires that. But the rumor that it was sinking is just, it's just a rumor. I heard that too. I was at a neighboring district. The other rumor I heard was that part of Losser that was taken down, there was no reason to take it down. It was just, you know, demo for no reason. And actually, there was quite a few great reasons. One, all the area was outdated. And to bring it up to code would have cost tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. It wasn't set for 21st century learning. And then the cost of heating and cooling it would have just been more expensive than just tearing it down, knowing that eventually, if you were going to repurpose it, you were going to have to tear it down, whether it was going to be a school or a green space anyhow. So that made me feel better. But I heard those two things as well. And being, again, at a neighboring district, we used to always joke with the Loster kids that your building's going to fall into the ground and you won't exist anymore. And I was glad to find out that wasn't true. Yeah, but I, I like your weather. But at the same time, I'm hoping to get to call a snow day for tomorrow. I've dreamed about that for almost 30 years. So and the odds are most likely we will, because it looks like the snow is going to come between like noon and 6, probably about 4 to 7 inches. But this is not a weather forecast. Um, but I am excited for that opportunity. Right? A snow day is great. Look, you're smiling. I love it, too. Um, other questions? Yes. I have a few kids in the district, um, including a kindergartner with special needs. Okay. So I was happy to hear that that they that are children with special needs that there are there's a focus on that in some of the changes. So you're looking not do. just a sensory room, but a therapy room as well, and then access to everything that is going to be at the farm, ADA and accessibility in the playgrounds. I mean, Security. all that. That's huge. Oh, no, yeah. Is, how are you, you know, you mentioned the security, for example, that you're looking at a couple of other examples. Right. When it comes to uh, special education, are you, what is your process moving forward in terms of making sure all those kids' needs are met? Are you getting parent involvement? Are you looking at other districts as examples? What's so the, you always have to look at other districts. When I say that, I mean outside of Oakland County as well. Yeah. It's great that we live in Oakland County, but it's not the end all to be all. There's a lot of great things happening out of state that would blow Oakland County out of the water. Mm -hmm. There's also two groups. There's the PAC group, yeah. and there's also the Friends of Different Learners. So I meet with both groups to discuss this. And as far as meeting. Okay. So, all right. No problem. So that's good. So we also need to look at how we're doing some of the classroom setups. You know, whether today, to let you know, we had a meeting about adding an ASD room because we currently don't have that. Right. Yet other people have added that 15 years ago. So we're moving forward. There's already posting for a job for that. So the goal is to have all of our students here as much as possible and not go elsewhere. And how do we do that? We're also looking at the idea of an AI or an EICI room in the future, right? 
again, having our students in the district schools that you move to for the, the, those reasons. Right, so between those two groups and best practices, that's how we're trying to move forward. Ideally for me, I'd like to have one meeting with the friends of different learners and the PAC group, but everyone has the same goal. They're passionate. How do we really help all of our students? What are we going to do for our special needs students who can't advocate for themselves? Who's advocating for them? And that's not just a job of the parents, that's a job as a district as well. I can tell you with quite a few of the school board members being new when I've had my meetings with them, this has been a huge area of focus for them. What are other people doing around the country that's great that we should be doing here to meet the needs of our students? Not just special needs students, and that was a big focus they had, but all of our students. We can't pretend that we know everything. We don't. And we have this habit, and I've been in Oakland County almost 30 years of saying the best. I'm coming for a district where I felt I had the best staff. I come here, now I have the best staff. Birmingham, so every, if everyone has the best staff, no one does. And having looked outside and had the opportunity to travel via my former district allowing me to go places, there are things I can share with you that they're doing. It's close by in Illinois for special ed. You would say, how have we not done that? Where have we been? How have we missed the boat? Who's in charge? Who's asleep at the wheel? Why isn't anyone making the decision? Why are we hearing about this? So it's a lot of work to be done. And having the bond helps with a lot of that because my former school I was at, we put a sensory room in for about a quarter of a million dollars, yeah. right? It would rival what you would see at the Friendship Circle. Students use it every single day. That costs money. Yeah. The easiest way to fund it is via the bond. And I hope everyone in the PAC sees that there's an emphasis for our special needs students throughout everything on this part. Yeah, I think that the, not the concern, the, look, the concern is just having a seat in the, at the table in that planning and, you know, making sure oh. that. So you know, if the, when the bond passes, if the bond passes, then the hard work starts, right? So that's where the learning service team comes in. So learning service team and top bid lack, they did a phenomenal job helping all this get together. And so people are asking, why aren't they at the table right now? Because we're about teaching and learning, right? They don't need to be here during a bomb presentation. All their focus has to be on instruction, my opinion. That's why they're not at any of these. We can do these. The bomb passes, that's where they step, they step in. What is the space going to look like? Where is the plug going to go? Well, you know, if this is going to be the sensory room, not only do we need LED lights, they need to be dimmable and they need to change colors because that's best practice, right? That's where the Friends of Different Learners and the PAC group comes in for those areas, working with the learning services team. If it's in the teachers, right? If you're teaching, you're in that room every day. You know what's best. And we always say so often in education, well, you're the expert, you're the expert, you're the expert, and it comes time to make a decision, and we don't pull people in. We sit at the top, and we make decisions that don't make sense, and the people in the building slip their hands and say, they were going to ask me, they never did, they don't care. We're not going to do that. Again, it's, it's great for me to say all these things, right? I would expect you to do what I do. I judge people by what they do, not what they say they're going to do. So if you look at my track record where I'm coming from my previous 26 years and talk to people, I think they'll let you know that I followed up and I did the things that I said I was going to do and I made it collaborative so everyone was able to have a voice. When you talk about furniture in a sensory room, what are we going to put in? Are we going to do the bubbles with the lights that change colors? Where are we going to place it? And why are we going to place it there as opposed to someplace else? Are we going to do the long, like, table you can sit on that vibrates. If we are, how many different vibration spots and what are they going to be? It takes a long time. And that's where the parents come in, the teachers come in. You know, if it's here and Mr. Russo's part of it, every single teacher in this building is going to want to have a say, right? Yeah. Promethean board should be here because the reflection from that, when it comes there and it's sunny, bounces off and hits there. I need a plug there, a plug there and a plug there, and I need a movable station and a laptop that can project whatever I'm teaching that flips to a tablet so I can move anywhere in the building and work with students and write and everyone I can see. That's where the hard work comes in. So Pat, I just wanted to add, well first of all, I'm Brian Gobi, Director of Physical Plant Services, and I was trying to stay off camera because I wore the same shirt last week when you guys taped me, and we see how that goes. But, um, 
but we do have some good experiences. Our prep program down at the Doyle or the Booth building, uh, we just expanded that and we put in the LED lights. We put in, um, they're dimmable. They do change colors, so we're able to get some feedback from those students down there. When we built the uh, Wing Lake Developmental Center, all the mechanicals are in a penthouse, so the rooms are super, super quiet. Um, but yes, we'll invite anyone and everyone to the table when we go through design. And I know that it, I know that there were people at the table for the scope and design, so I just wanted to make sure that that it didn't end with that. So I'm glad to hear it. No, and I rambled on. I'm sorry. No, I get no. passionate about this yeah. because I think so often in education, our poor students and our minority students and our special needs students get the short end of the stick because no one's oftentimes advocating for them or they become our forgotten students. So working with the board, that was a big part of their process was this equity and inclusion piece that if we're going to go for a bond, we need to really make sure those three groups were really focused on serving. And then that will make sure we serve all of our students. So kind of leading with that first. Yes. Two questions actually. Do we have preliminary metrics around um, whether or not this is going to pass the bond um, and what direction people are, are looking to, to vote? And second question is, is there a feet on the street campaign that people can join in and participate if they're pro the bond? So let me answer the first one, and I'll let Lisa Afros answer the second one. So some districts do like an epic uh, MRI poll. We did not. Um, it never, I mean, especially the way things are now, you might have to make 8,000 calls to hopefully talk to 4,000 people. A good example of that is when we went to talk to Ann Arbor. They did an epic MRI poll. They talked to 4,000 real people and said, if we go for a billion dollar bond, will you vote yes? You don't get any more information. 71, 72% said yes, we'd vote for it. So Ann Arbor said, this is easy, slam dunk. We'll go for the bond. They went for the bond and passed by 51%. What group was the roadblock? What do you think? Take a guess. People that have children that have aged out. No, staff. Oh. We're not getting steps and raises. We don't want your bond. Again, again, you pass the bond, none of that money can be used for steps, raises, you know, salary. It can't be used for that. It's all set for infrastructure. That's the only thing it can be used for, nothing else. So they went from, this is easy, we'll get a billion dollars, no problem, to, oh my gosh, this may not pass. And to really go out and poll, it's not dire straits. But when you look in the next three to five years, what these buildings are going to need, it really needs to happen. Wait, wait for what? Until one day people decide, okay, it's bad enough now, or we've had to cut programs and increase, increase class sizes, so now I'm okay for it, right? We need to think forward, we need to be ahead. If we're going to be leaders, not just in Oakland County, but in the state, the Midwest, and nationally, this is at least a minor step. And if facilities didn't matter, you wouldn't see the University of Michigan, a school that, that gets 60 something thousand applicants every year via the Common App, invest in facilities if they didn't matter because they don't need the kids. They can't service the kids that apply. And roughly 48 to 49% are out of state, right? It makes a difference. And then, Ms. Efros, if you could answer the question about how to get involved from a parent perspective. <clears throat> so, yes, this is going to pass. We know this because uh, we didn't hire an Epic MRI, but we did get much better sources, and that's moms who crunch numbers. So, uh, to that end, we have um, divided precincts. Uh, I'm actually going to flip it to we have one of the um, advocacy committee, Bloomfield Forward leaders here and they can tell you more that's a, a great question can, can you hope or are you filming i was going to throw it to you so you could tell them how to get involved and how to i know she's like, filming all right how can they get involved uh i know that they're looking for um definitely people going door to door with li passing out literature talking to neighbors informing people um and uh, is there some kind of sign-up sheet maybe we can pass around? I can uh, come up with something, yes, for sure. Okay. And I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say in this meeting. because You can say anything uh, you want. Because it's put on by the district. But um, yes, we're looking for neighborhood captains 
to um, to kind of, sorry, I don't even know where to put this now. <laughs> We're looking for um, neighborhood captains and uh, Jennifer Cook is going to be in charge of this. And um, so each precinct has a certain amount of neighborhoods and someone would be in charge of that and get a bunch of people to kind of just walk around the neighborhood, talk to people. We'll have books with literature in them to, to talk with the talking points and to show them. And we'll have door signs you can put on if people aren't home. It's really the easiest job that you could volunteer for, for sure, and we need a, a ton of people. Because right now, I'm on the advocacy team. I was part of Scope and Design, and I'm also the, the captain of the neighborhood at the moment because I'm having trouble finding someone for my precinct. But um, yeah, again, like we have a ton of volunteer opportunities, and you guys can reach out anytime. This year, if you want to come see me, I can tell you which precincts and are I can, open. And I can take a sign-up sheet, too. Also, uh, we found out this morning that we have the uh, teachers' union endorsement, which is huge to me, because we could do this without teacher endorsements, and there have been communities that have, unfortunately. Um, and even it could even pass without it, but it would never feel right to me to do it without their endorsement. So it was really nice to be able to have, uh, and um, you know, you'll see them going door to door as well. They've already been contacting us and asking how they can get involved. So mm -hmm. I feel I feel like it's going to pass. Other questions? All right, well, thank you for coming. We should have an update about the snow day after 8 o'clock. Yeah, one hour, right? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.